Well, it's official. Every single year that WrestleMania season comes about, we have a Royal Rumble. It might be decent like it was this year. It was pretty good. And then they kind of just settle in for the next couple of months. Nothing really happens. This used to be the most exciting time of the year. And I'm not even going to use the Attitude Era. You could even go back to, you know, times when WWE even had it rough in 1995. At least they excited people with Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam Bigelow. Big matches that actually had, so, you know, not a lot of star power, but there was star power. And they built up and they made things exciting. They made it feel like it was something huge and massive. And that was, like I said, during a time when their content wasn't that great. And it really goes to show what I, I said a while back. That everyone likes to go back and say that 1995 was the worst uh, year in WWE history. I gotta tell you that I think that it, that year looks like a complete masterpiece in comparison. And there's a good argument that could be made there. You know, you've... You had uh, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, uh, better commentary. You know, there, there was a, a a lot of stuff that was really bad during that time. It was super cartoonish, but like, is now any better? At least, you know, certain wrestlers were protected. You know, you didn't have Shawn Michaels running around looking like a goofball. Neither did Diesel um you, you know or, or bret hart you know these guys actually were respectable on this roster you look at, at these stars and it's like you can't really respect anybody because the way how they're booked uh you could look at it you know from the standpoint that you know these people are written into these stories and that is why they look bad but you know just taking everything all together uh you know 95 looks like a better year so anyway with that in mind, I'm observing this uh, as just being one of the worst Mania builds ever. And, and we're only a few weeks into it. But, you know, you could feel the Mania build. Like, you, you go back and you look at classic years. And everyone hates when I do, do this because it's, it's so tired. Uh, but it is oh so true to go back and compare this product to the Attitude Era. I am sorry... But we need to do this. And like I said, you could use the Ruthless Aggression Era. You could swap out various time periods. But I'm going to use one of the best examples. You know, we, we have to go back to what I say. That, you know, I, I believe that Vince Russo is one of the best writers in wrestling history. Uh, and, and case in point, please go back and watch Survivor Series 1998. And then you watch as... You know, Russo and, and, and you know, and, and Ed Ferrara as they weaved together a storyline. You know, not just them, but The Rock and, and Mick Foley and Stone Cold Steve Austin. As they built that match for The Rock and Stone Cold. I know originally it was supposed to be a triple threat match, but, you know, plans changed and it was altered. But needless to say... There was a huge, massive storyline, and you could feel the power, the magic, the majesty of WrestleMania for nearly five months. That's when you really knew that WrestleMania was truly, truly special. When they actually started to build Mania, and you know, people like to talk about slow burns and everything. Oh, you got to give a storyline some time. How come back then you didn't need to give a storyline some time? Like, right off the bat, it was awesome, and you couldn't wait for the next week. Where is that wrestling? Where is that WWE? Where the storylines and the matches and the characters are all great, and you want to see all the matches, and you want to see the storyline play now, and you want to see the next episode of Raw, and you want to see the pay-per-view. Now, you know, if we watch the show, we're sitting there like, okay, let's see how this is. Back then, it wasn't like, okay, let's see how this is. You were excited for the show. So I'm sorry if people get offended, but I've said this in the past. It's time to raise your standards up a bit. If you feel like this schlock is good stuff, 
if you're watching AEW Dynamite and you're saying that this is one of the best years in wrestling, if you're watching NXT and you're saying, what, what a time to be alive, then, you know, it's time to really get in touch with reality. Because at this point, you look at the ratings, you see the excitement or lack thereof surrounding the product and the whole profession of professional wrestling. You got to admit that this is not the wrestling boom period that everyone is making it out to be. Um, you know, this whole AEW NXT war, it's all a lie. It doesn't even need to be said here in this video. The ratings speak for themselves, you know. I've been saying this for years here on this channel. Why do other TV shows, why do they have high ratings but WWE doesn't? You know what I'm saying? It, it speaks for itself. Never mind people streaming and DVRing it. If the show was that good, people would be watching it on Friday night. They would be watching it on Monday night. They would not be waiting several days to see it yes some people might not be home but most people are they were back in the day and people are still watching shows during the week so it it, it doesn't make any sense but let's get to the meat of the show this was um very surprising there was very few matches on it kind of looking back i don't even know how they really filled up all that time because there wasn't really a whole lot that went on in this show. How can it be so uneventful, yet, you know, they don't have anything really even on this show, yet it, it, it took two hours for them to get through it. Well, you know, with commercials, an hour and a half. But we start off with um, Bailey crashing the, the moment of bliss. So they gave Alexa Bliss her show back after like a few months absence you know, um, they were just having a wrestle meaningless matches. I don't know what happened with Alexa Bliss, like why she was considered to be like, you know, champion material. And then all of a sudden, like they, you know, it's like almost like they were punishing her for getting a concussion. And that's like, that's something that they've done in the past. They've done it to Dolph Ziggler, if anyone can remember. How dare you get a concussion? How dare you, you know, risk your life and, and risk your health uh, for this company? I mean, that's got to be the most sleazebag tactic ever. But it is something that is pretty clear cut. And, you know, I wouldn't believe it if I didn't see it for myself with Ziggler. But now when I see it, you know, numerous times, people get injured, people get punished. I think Alexa Bliss is a firm um, example of that. Now, I and I don't get what this whole thing is with her and Nikki Cross. Like, it seemed like they were going to break them up. And now that, like, Alexa's cleared to wrestle, she just, you know, Nikki's sitting there. There's no chemistry at all. Um, they're interviewing Carmella. And, you know, I'm looking back on, like, Carmella when she first won the title. Remember, I, I was even... I was praising her in my reviews. I was saying, you know, people were like, oh, she doesn't know how to wrestle. You know, because she wasn't Sasha Banks. Uh, you know, she she wasn't one of the, you know, the fan favorites. You, you know, so they didn't like that Carmella was one of the more attractive diva-like girls. You know, so they, they didn't want, like, one of the girls from Total Divas, uh, uh, like, being a champion. Me meanwhile, she was cutting the best promos at the time, even out you know ranking a lot of the men's promos which is not really saying a whole lot of course but she was doing some some really good work as a champion she was coming across very well as a star but now they like took away her like staten island style accent you know they, they really uh did a number on her character now they kind of just turned her into just another valley girl you know just talking like one of the bellas basically and that right there just kind of shows that, you know, no one's allowed to have a character. No one's truly allowed to get over. If you want to get over, if you want to have a character, it's just not possible. If you if you want one, you're going to be treated like dirt. Like, you know, just look at The Fiend. You know, you look at what they're doing with The Fiend right now. And man, they have really cooled down on him. We're going to talk about that in a second. But 
we'll, we'll, you know, we'll get to that when we do. Anyway, Bailey comes out and like talk about overacting. It, it, it's almost like she's overacting, but like overacting would actually require effort, you, you know, to like overact. You would actually like kind of need to now, but this is like a weird like nexus that we're at you, you know where she's kind of at the intersection of overacting but like barely putting in an effort she's just the absolute worst i think i've ever seen there's really nothing likable about this individual there's nothing to like about this entertainer if you could even go so far as to call her that you know, technically she is an entertainer, you know, uh, because she's a wrestler in an entertainment company. So, but, you know, you really have to be entertaining really to be an entertainer. But regardless of the technicalities, she's awful. And it really, really shows. And, it, you know, not only was she cringy as a face... You can at least say, oh, okay, well, the kid's like, oh, okay, well, fine. That's why we should keep her around. Not like they really did anything to really push the fact that, you know, like she should be a role model for kids. Uh, there was nothing really being shown that would make her that way. They put no effort into anything. They're like, okay, here's her character. We're not going to do anything with storylines or TV time to try to develop that character and, you know, flesh it out. And show you what she's all about. So maybe we could maybe like her. Who knows if this was another time and another place. And WWE actually gave a hoot. Perhaps I would actually like Bailey. I, but you know I, 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 there's nothing for me to like here. She's not attractive. I don't find anything about her like sexy or becoming about her. I don't find a, you know, a single thing that she does on the mic good. And really like in the ring. Uh, you know, okay, she's working hard. I'm not going to say that she doesn't do her job well in the ring, but it's nothing exciting. It's it's nothing different than anyone else is really doing. Like, is Carmella like that much worse of a wrestler than Bailey? If you ask the Smarks, they'll say yes. You ask me, a realist, and I say no. <laughs> uh, there's more to like about Carmella. I'm saying attractive, good with promos. Uh, you know, likable. Uh, you know, she could play both the face and the heel. I I don't know why they decided to take away her accent, which is something that okay, maybe people from across the country might not get it, but I'm just saying she's not really from Staten Island anyway. But that's besides the point. Anyway, um, mostly what I want to say here is what it. Why are they wasting Alexa Bliss? Uh, why would they take someone who's clearly even better than Carmella with promos? She was the best. I will never go back. I will never forget what, speaking of, of Bailey, remember that this is your life segment, how terrible Bailey did in that segment. And granted, it wasn't neither girl's fault. That was just a horribly written segment. Blame McMahon. Blame creative. Don't blame the talent. I would never blamed Bailey, even when that happened back in 2017. But but you saw that Alexa Bliss tried her hardest to turn, you know, chicken, you know what, into chicken salad. She really tried her damnedest, and she started to succeed a little bit. But there was no way that you could have turned that bat guano into like you know an amazing segment there was no way it was going to happen everything was working against them when it came to that to that huge mess that huge disaster but you saw how much of a star she was that she held her ground you saw that she wasn't embarrassed she wasn't mortified she wasn't deterred from doing her job and you know i think that should mean something that level of effort should really mean something but apparently it doesn't it, it, all it, you know, it, it's it, seemingly to me, if you dare get injured, it's your responsibility and we're going to punish you because you weren't careful enough. Never mind the fact that you've got these, these goofy, you know, talents in there now doing moves that are so dangerous. I mean, for God's sakes, look what happened with Sasha Banks and Paige. Sasha Banks ended Paige's career and it's like, 
you know, because Paige tried to be a professional and play it off and say, oh, it's fine. I'm not going to play it off because I'm totally independent of all that. So, you know, I, <laughs> I'm a casual observer. So I'm going to look at this and basically say, no, she ended her career. <laughs> she needs to be held responsible for that. She was not careful. She's, you know, we have to remember that this is a fake predetermined form of entertainment and that like Bret Hart said it is your job as a wrestler to take care of your opponent you know no one's supposed to get hurt in this it's not real now of course it's physical and injuries do happen but you have to look at like I'm talking about 1995 look back then did you see as many injuries did you see careers ending early no you didn't you only started to see this when the style started to progress and get more dangerous i mean now they're starting to do pile drivers again they're doing canadian destroyers but like th this is this is not good this is not a good way for this to go and this comes at a time when the injuries are up and they're doing canadian destroyers they're doing flip pile drivers like they don't look back to 1997 look at owen hart and stone cold steve austin and saw the tragedy that happened during SummerSlam, and you know and, and see how that still affected stone cold a few years later does anyone realize that stone cold steve austin like really had a very short career came into wwe in in 19 like late 95 early 96 and he was out of there but you know um pr pretty much you know the beginning of 2003 think like not even 10 years not, not even close it was like an eight-year career you kind of have to think that or really like a seven-year career think think about john cena and batista and triple h and how uh long their careers were they think of how long they kept their careers up and and, and stone cold was out of there you know with the injury super early all due to that you know that and that was like a mistake you actually had a good worker in there owen hart who was taking care of stone cold they did one dangerous move was over shouldn't they look at something like that from more than 20 years ago and realize that it's not smart to start flipping people over with the same move basically anyway um we could go on about this all day but the main point still remains that they should not uh be punishing people for getting injured when it's actually their fault in the first place for putting them in that position and allowing them to you know get concussions and not even take care of them when they do and punish them uh, like I, I just i don't know but anyway they decide to have the match instead of having it at super showdown bailey and carmella bailey actually pins carmella like a heel um i was really surprised to see that it's very rare when a heel actually gets a win by having their feet on the ropes, usually another, usually like th they'll end up kicking out, but that was actually a pretty good finish. That's a way how, you know, you could see a wrestler escape, a heelish wrestler escaping with the title. So I can't really knock them too hard on that style of booking. I don't know what happened where, why they decided, well, we don't want to have Carmella in Saudi Arabia. Because that was weird. Like, they just made that match last week. They already changed their mind and flipped it. Uh, okay, maybe they have something else in mind. I don't know. Maybe Carmella decides she doesn't want to dress from head to toe in, you know, like, uh, basically in, in just a, a big, a big flowing, uh, you know, uh, super-sized t-shirt. No, yeah, you know, the, maybe she doesn't want to bundle up, as I keep saying. Like last year when Lacey Evans and Natalia did. I don't think that they want to end up in the same position. But oh, there's so much wrong with this. Anyway, um, Naomi comes rushing into the ring. I, you know, I, I like her with the afro. But like how she looked um, last week. But this, it's like a pink afro. It's too much. It's just, it, it doesn't look good. I get it, you know. She's supposed to have a bit of an outrageous style. That's good. You know, it makes her stand out, certainly. But th th that, that was a bit much. Not crazy about the look. Anyway, she attacks Bailey, knocks her out of the ring. 
uh, we move on. Otis is backstage with Tucker. And this is what I'm talking about having a character. You, you, I don't know if you guys see it. I don't really see it as, as much people commenting on it. But Otis is a bona fide star. I look at this guy, the facial expressions. People have compared him to Chris Farley. That's very accurate. I, I definitely see that in him. The faces, the way how he pronounces words. No one could act like this guy, basically, which makes him very special. And I feel like they're holding on to something great, but they're, once again, they're not realizing its full potential, just like Elias, just like a whole bunch of others that have come their way. Uh, they're not doing this guy justice. And, and I get, you know, they want to do a little cutesy storyline for Valentine's Day. Okay, you know, I, I see where they're going there. Um, this was entertaining. But it could be just so much more. And, I, you know, I'm not saying make this guy the world champion or anything like that. I get it. He might be a bit of a niche character. But you can't just have all these these guys that are standing out so much. When you have people like Bailey on the roster. And then you show me a guy like Otis. Uh, never mind the difference in gender there. I'm just saying that there are some people... Who are standing out on these shows so clearly as being more talented, being more TV presentable, more entertaining, and just more likable. And I feel like they're just not realizing this. They're just kind of giving him a, a cheap storyline that's not really going to mean anything at the end of the day. It's not really getting ratings, so it's like, you know, it, it might be... You know, it's a good way of having Otis act out. But, like, these are just really fast one-minute, two-minute segments. I feel like it is a true waste of talent. Um, anyway, Sheamus is backstage. Uh, well, I mean to say Otis was backstage getting ready for the date. Uh, yes, Sheamus defeats Apollo Crews and Shorty G in a handicap match. And I hope that this ends because now he beat Shorty G and Apollo Crews at the same time. So, like, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't get this. You know, they see that Sheamus is, like, in the best shape of his life. They don't even put him in the Royal Rumble. He's doing these video packages on SmackDown. Like, you don't even put the guy in the Royal Rumble? Like, this is Triple H's friend. Like, I'm telling you, something happened with, like, Triple H, uh, like, 2014... 2015 when he started really getting into nxt this guy's whole perspective on the business has changed and i don't know what it is i don't know if he's trying to play the part as like the keeper of the smarks but like this guy from everything that we used to see and we used to hear this guy was old school this guy is supposed to be a fan of the four horsemen Right? Didn't he look up to Ric Flair? Didn't he look up to Arn Anderson? Didn't he look up to Tully Blanchard? Um, you know, like, what what happened? Well, what what happened to that Triple H? What happened to that guy? You know, that, that worked a more methodical, technical style that wasn't all about the, the flips and kicks and, you know, all the cheapness, you know, that, that goes in it, like... Eh, wasn't Triple H all about the promos and being character driven and really like, you know, getting people over and making them look strong? Okay, well, you know, he held a lot of people down. I get it. But I'm saying this guy had a very, very different look. And speaking of that, like holding people down, like, you know, it was all about like making him look strong. Now he doesn't want to make anyone look too strong. You know, because everyone's got to be equal. It's all about equality. Never mind that some people are doing a better job than others on this show and standing out. This this guy is, I don't know. It's almost like Triple H was like, uh, you know, replaced by a clone that looks like him but has a completely different personality. It's almost like Triple H is a robot and, it, you know, and there's like a smark like inside his head. And, and, and you know just like at, moving his arms legs and mouth you know and they just i don't know they're speaking through a voice changer or something because this is not the same guy 
uh, how he could allow like uh, you know his friend Sheamus that deserve what he got by the way Sheamus looked the part he sounded the part and you know just he he's good he's agile on the ring there is no reason why this guy should be held down the way that he is but you know needless to say Sheamus has fallen very far I, I don't know why they even bar to hype him up with video packages no one's excited for this return now because you're having him face Shorty G and Apollo Crews uh, the, these guys are not worth a damn. I'm sorry to say, yes, you know, Apollo Cruz's ship has long sailed. Uh, Shorty G, you pretty much wrote this guy off the minute you dressed him this way, and you um, and you called him. I, I don't know, Shorty G, uh, may, maybe. <laughs> anyway, this, this was just a little bit odd. You know, they're having these 50-50 matches. Sheamus and Shorty G. Oh, it looks like. Shorty G might beat him, which is ridiculous. And then he just comes in and just destroys both of them. Like, okay. Uh, you know, that made a lot of sense. Then we have a, a segment with Hulk Hogan. And I don't know where they were tonight, but like Hogan did not get a good reaction. Like, are we still hung up on this, you know, this controversy with Hulk Hogan? Are people or like, you know, fans still taking this to heart? You, you know, I mean, come on already. Uh, I mean, the guy made a mistake. Uh, obviously, you see the company he keeps. I, I'm not getting into this right now. All I'm just saying is that if you're still going on about Hulk Hogan, I don't know what to tell you. Fine. Buddha guy, whatever. He's an absolute legend. This company, I guarantee you, would not even be here today if it wasn't for that man. This company probably would have went out and went out of business, like in the late '80s or the early '90s, if it wasn't for Hulk Hogan. So, I, you know, I really don't know what to tell you. That people really like, kind of disrespected, probably one of the biggest personalities of all time when it comes to wrestling and you know, and, and some media even. Uh, I mean, we're talking about a guy that. Uh, like basically uh, was the centerpiece of this very organization. Anyway, uh, he's talking about the Hall of Fame. Uh, Bray Wyatt interrupts. Um, I don't know. There, there was like some hints here. Like I always thought it was supposed to be split personality where Bray wasn't directly acknowledging that he was the Fiend. But there was a line in here where he did say that. Which, I don't know, there was a bit of an inconsistency there. I always thought it's supposed to be like he's supposed to be talking about The Fiend as if it's, you know, a, a third party. You know, but uh, I don't know. There was some language here where I don't know if that was a mistake or they're not really too concerned about it. Making it look like it's two people anymore. Um, okay, but this there was entertaining parts of this. Could it have been better? Of course, what couldn't be? Uh, you, you know, especially nowadays, I like, you know, how he came in black and white, the Firefly Funhouse, you know, um, he, he, he came in, you know, doing the air guitar on the belt. Um, you know, that, that was a nice little spot. I saw a lot of people did appreciate that. Um, you know, Hulk Hogan kind of speaking for Goldberg. I don't know. This was just kind of a weird way of kind of cramming two things together. I'm not a really big fan of them doing this. Like, pay Goldberg extra, get him there. Like, come, like I'm so sick of this with Brock Lesnar and the part timers. Like, just give him a little extra money. All the money you're making from Saudi Arabia, all the money you're making from Fox. I know that you're, you know, uh, you're making more than you're actually profiting. Like, a lot of that is going towards cost. So, you know, a lot of people don't seem to realize that, that they're not, they might be making a lot of money, but they're not really profiting a whole lot. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. You know, the next time someone says, oh, you're saying they get bad ratings, but they're doing the best they've been in a while. Okay, that's what they're grossing. We shouldn't, like, really base that on really anything. Um, anyway... I don't like where they when they just book these part-timers and it's like, oh well, 
we're, we're going to have him there every other week or every two weeks. So Goldberg is going to be there next week. But like, here's like Hulk Hogan, and he tells a story that we've heard a thousand times. Yes, we've seen it on the network. We, I've seen, I saw it live when it happened. The Hulk Hogan versus Goldberg it, on Nitro Classic match. You know, probably one of the greatest matches of all time. Not, you know, I'm not talking about technically. I'm saying based on spectacle. And that was what a match used to be. It was the spectacle. It was what that match was about. What that match stood for, really, more than anything else. Um, not like how many moves were involved and then how crisp they looked. Ridiculous. A anyway, like, I I'm just kind of sick of this. And once again, banking on nostalgia. We've built no new stars. Like, you know, we have to drag out Hogan. We have to drag out Goldberg. The Fiend hasn't done anything in weeks of any note. What, what happened to the Fiend coming out? The ring going dark and coming out from under the ring. Like, they've even abandoned that. Uh, like, seriously, and then Bray's going on social media and just, you know, he, he he's tweeting about the XFL. Oh, there's nothing like, you know, The Fiend uh, sending out a tweet about a, a television show, about a sports game. I, I mean, are you kidding me? And then he vents his frustrations on Twitter. Like, uh, if you're going to have these type of kayfabe characters and you're gonna try to tell a story on tv you can't be going on social media and like saying hey guys you know i'm playing a part but i have my own opinions like i i get it social media has killed kayfabe but i've been saying it for years now if kayfabe is dead why are we still doing it why don't they just integrate real life situations into this instead of continuing with the fairy tales continuing with this old-fashioned style of storytelling that nobody believes anyway and says a thousand times that it's phony uh, you know we need to start integrating the the real life into it more because people are just looking at this and just saying it's fake it's laughable it's it's clown stuff i mean anyway hogan gets frustrated and walks off which is just like I, 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 that I'm just saying is just like a cheap out. Once again, really bad writing. Like, the two participants here, they're trying the best they can with very bad material that's just, you know, not... Like, what was basically told here? What did we accomplish? There, there's no match between The Fiend and Hulk Hogan. There, it's between Goldberg and The Fiend. So Hogan is basically talking about his experience with Goldberg... The Fiend is there to make fun of him. What was really accomplished? Are they building towards the match? Are they building the storyline more? No. He addresses Goldberg and says, Bye, Goldberg. But that's about it. I mean, really, you break this down, you look at it. And you have to say, like, what did we get out of this? This really did not do anything. And yeah, like, once it's nice to see Hulk Hogan, it's nice to see Goldberg, but no one's even there. It's all via satellite. I, I, I don't know, was that what they were booing because it was via satellite and they just had Goldberg there via satellite? Or I think that they were actually booing Hogan. You know, anyway. Let, then we get a little um, protest concert. Sami Zayn and Cesaro out there. Um you've got Sammy holding a ukulele, Cesaro holding a bell, and you already know this is just going to be some goofball nonsense. Uh, you know, okay, you know, Sammy is trying, like I said, I much prefer him in this role than an actual in-ring competitor. Uh, Elias comes out, Braun comes out, they beat them up. Okay, great. Like, once again... You know, these are stars that are spinning their wheels. You know, uh, Braun Strowman just won a singles title. Here he is teaming up with Elias. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's once again, the same thing. We're, we're, we're going to start building someone up and then we're going to remain them stagnant. Like, Elias has been in this company now for, for now just about three years. He, he's been on the main roster rather, right? And he's done nothing with them. They've done nothing with him. And he's proven himself time and time again. Gets massive heel heat. He gets a good reaction as a baby face. He gets the crowd to you know, sing along with him. 
No one else is capable of that. No one. Uh, like, is Bailey doing it? No. I mean, you know, is is anyone really doing that? No, not at all. That no one is doing it. Those that they, that are deemed to be over, you know, like was Seth Rollins getting that as a baby face? No. No one gets the heat that Elias does. So there's there's no excuse. He's in this meaningless segment. And uh, I didn't. I don't think did Nakamura show up. I don't think so. Just Cesaro. So like I thought the whole thing is supposed to be between Braun and Nakamura. Uh, you know, or well, I forgot to call him Nakamurphy, right? Oh, so I actually said his real name this time. Anyway, uh, so like a real waste of time here. Nothing done. You know, am I supposed to chuckle at Sami Zayn holding a ukulele? It's not funny. It's not funny at all. It's it's not entertaining. Elias is way too talented to be wasting away in garbage segments like this. Um, then we see Otis, um, you know, going to the dinner. He's looking for Mandy Rose. They show Mandy sitting at a table at the restaurant that he goes into. Dolph Ziggler uh, is, you know, they, they see a hand tapping Mandy on the shoulder. It's Dolph Ziggler, and, and uh, Ziggler sits down at the table. Otis comes, looks at the table, sees that Mandy and Ziggler are in conversation. He drops the roses and leaves all upset. Um, okay. I, 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 I don't, you know, I, I want to say like, okay, you know, Otis acted this out well. They're telling the story. Let's wait to see what happens next week and everything. But like, I think the right course of action here would have had Otis be mad, go over, say something to Ziggler, toss the table over, uh, play devil's advocate and say, okay, maybe they wanted to try to, you know, tell a story here. They'll, you know, have uh, Otis say something to Ziggler next. But why? Say it there like he's he's there. He's upset. Otis is this big guy. I understand that he's supposed to be like a little shy and nervous and all that. But, like, he goes in the ring and he tears Ziggler apart. Well, they've had tag matches, right? So, here it's like he's just going to stand there and then walk away? Like, here's an opportunity to do something entertaining. You know, he flipped the table over last week. Why not do it again, but this time do it to Ziggler? It would have been funny. Maybe the food could go all over all over mandy mandy could get mad at otis maybe and slap him or something like that and then you could have otis like you know um get mad and just start punching ziggler you know it would be a good story you know this um you know this this bully like jock and in, in Dolph ziggler you know he uh he gets what's coming to him i don't know just something like that just a little something extra than just ending the segment with one of your most entertaining characters on the roster um anyway let, let's uh, just end this here with uh, roman reigns and daniel bryan defeating the miz and morrison which doesn't even make any sense apparently miz and morrison were scheduled to face the usos but the usos you know having legal trouble you know they got arrested in the past so they couldn't appear so instead it's going to be you know roman reigns is going to fill in and and, and Daniel Bryan is the partner for no particular reason. Um, Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan win, which is confusing because it's like, okay, so these guys just came back as a tag team, and then you're going to have these main eventers come along and just crush them like they're nothing. Okay, that that was great. Um, I, 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 if the Usos were there, they probably wouldn't have lost like this emphatically. Okay, like this did nothing for the team. Like it's Miz and Morrison. Obviously, they weren't going to win against a, like a super team like Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan, unless there was going to be some disagreement between the two. But they've already done that storyline, so there was no point in doing this. And then the show ends. And what was accomplished? And what did we do here at the end? That's the main event? Okay, well, do you maybe want to build something there for um, for Super Showdown? You know, anything? No, it's, it's probably going to be forgotten about next week. I mean, 
what are we really doing here? Like, do we care about WrestleMania anymore? There's rumors about WrestleMania, you know, being on Fox maybe next year. Oh, okay, if we're going to do that, then maybe we should try harder. Like, I don't get it. This company refuses to put in an effort. And I'm seeing people saying that this company has improved. Really? Has it? Has it really improved? I do not see any improvement at all. Uh, I see certain things getting worse. Like speaking of Roman Reigns, I don't see them doing anything with this guy. Y you know, th th this was world champion material. A few fans complain. Um, you know, the, he got cancer, he came back, he's a bit more of a fan favorite. People have more respect for him now as a survivor, I suppose. Um, you know, they never put the belt back on him. Uh, they kept it on Rollins, and I, like, I seriously do not know what they're doing w w with Roman Reigns. I don't know what they're doing with The Fiend. Uh, this just having a, a, a Goldberg Fiend match is probably one of the oddest things. It's interesting. I want to see it. Okay, so I guess that's you know mission accomplished on their end. But it's it's just like weird that it doesn't seem like anything is ever progressing in this company. You know, just like case in point, like look at who they had to w win the Royal Rumble. Drew McIntyre, excellent choice. Great wrestler with natural charisma just, you know, oozing off of him. Guy's got an aura. He's got a presence. He's good on the mic. He's good in the ring. He, he, you know, he's, he's got it all. He's a complete package. And then they have this guy calling himself the sexy Scotsman and, and the dream maker. I mean, no one progresses. They regress. And, and you see the same thing with, with, with someone like Seth Rollins. The, this, the whole year of 2019 was built around Seth Rollins. Now he's a tag champ. They bring back Edge at the Royal Rumble. Oh man, Edge is back. Huge reaction. One of the biggest things. It, it boosts the Raw ratings even. People actually gave a damn. And now he hasn't been there for two whole weeks. He, he appeared on Raw against the Concerto. He's out for two weeks. Not even a medical update. Not even a via satellite. Not even a pre-tape. Nothing. Nada. Got nothing. Zilch. Zero. The, I mean, they don't care. It's just like, yeah, whatever. Put this on this week. Yeah, they could wait. You know, we don't need to show Edge. I mean, I'm just saying, get, give an effort. Do something. Show me you care. This is this whole show is just abysmal in every way. Like I like seeing Hogan. A little bit of what Bray Wyatt did was funny copying Hogan. But even at the end of the day, I don't even see a point to that. What stories are being told? What characters are being created? You you have a, a, a comedic gem with, with Otis, and like they just have the guy walk away when there's there's further stories to be told. I, I mean, like, there's, there's, you know, a story requires it to go places. There has to be interesting twists and turns. It can't just be from point A to point B. Sometimes it needs to go to, like, point B, A. And you need to need, have different stages and throw in, you know, different randomized events. Because that's, like, how life is. It's a series of random events. You know, but not so random that it doesn't make sense. I mean, like, throw curveballs in there. Take a little bit of a note of what was so successful during the Ruthless Aggression era and the Attitude era and all the other, you know, time periods that people actually like. I mean, once again, and now we're going back and we're doing a special on the Ruthless Aggression era on the network. Hey, guys, remember when we used to be great? My point exactly. Living in the past. Goldberg. Hogan. You know, counting on, on part-timers to, you know, to, to, to sell out arenas and to actually garner in, any sort of interest. Even though you have characters on your roster that can make you money, that could get people into arenas. They do have people like that on the roster. I've, I've, I've told you who they are, you know, but they're not making an effort to really cement that in and really show you why you need to see these people. Anyway. 
Guys, I hope you all enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Click the bell so you get all the notifications when I post all my new videos. And guys, I'll see you next time.